Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the special Formats 2 session. Um, I'm Mary Seam. Uh, this is, I think, really interesting and exciting, and I'm really curious to hear about everybody's projects. I'm just going to run through all the presenters right at the top, and then we'll do questions at the end of everyone's presentation. So if you have questions, <coughs> keep them in mind. Um, the first up is Chu Chiat Nan, who um, is the head of metadata creation at Harvard Library and active in the program um, for cooperative cataloging. He co-chairs the PCC Standing um, Committee on Standards and served on the PCC URIs and MARC Task Group. And the next is Peter Chan, who is the digital archivist at Stanford University, and he served as the project manager for EPAD, lots of acronyms, Email, Process, Appraise, Discover, and Deliver, um, and was a member of the AIMS, which is an interinstitutional model for stewardship project. The AIMS project uh, and the EPAD project were both recipients of the NDSA award. Uh, Peter pioneered the use of access data FTK to appraise and process foreign digital collections and built workstations that can meet 8-inch floppy disks. Uh, up after that is Mark McGee, who is the Geospatial Metadata Librarian at um, Harvard Library Information Technical Services, and is coordinating the LD4P2 subproject uh, exploring the description of scanned historic cartographic images. Mark has 15 years of experience cataloging geospatial resources, including rare paper cartographic materials in the Harvard Map Collection, and digital geospatial data sets uh, for the Harvard Ge Geospatial Library. And up after that is Nancy Bogren. Uh, Nancy is the Senior Metadata Librarian in the Cataloging and Metadata Management section of the National Library of Medicine. She's been working with BitFrame and Linked Data Technologies at NLM and in the library community since representing NLM in the Library of Congress's Early Experimenters Group in 2012. Nancy currently leads the National Library of Medicine's LD4P2 cohort project, which is focused on serials cataloging. And then we have Brad Allen, who is the chief architect at Elsevier, where he leads the architecture group within Elsevier's technology organization, focusing, focusing on driving technology vision and roadmaps in collaboration with corporate strategy, working with development teams to build and evolve products and infrastructure, and guiding Elsevier Labs collaborative research into the field of scientific and medical publishing. Uh, prior to Elsevier, Brad was a founder and CTO at a series of enterprise software startups in the LA area, uh, achieving successful exits of two of the three. Uh, he began his career in LA at the Inter Inference Corporation as one of the very first knowledge engineers. Brad is the co-inventor of five US patents and has BS in applied mathematics from Carnegie Mellon. And then we have Rosie <laughs> Stevenson, good night. Um, Rosie is a visiting scholar at Northwestern <coughs> University Women's Writers Project, and she serves as the Vice President of Wikimedia District of Columbia, uh, and sits on the Board of Advisors of Women in Journalism. In 2016, she retired from a 26-year management uh, career at Davida Healthcare Partners. Uh, a prolific Wikipedia editor, Rosie has created almost 5,000 new articles, and she's the founder of Wikipedia's project on women writers. Um, and co-founder of Wiki Women in Red, a multi-language project devoted to increasing the percentage of women's biographers. In 2016, she was named the Wikipedian of the Year and was shortlisted for the GemTech Award at the ITU UN Women for, uh, women for her efforts <coughs> in technology for women's empowerment and digital inclusion. Uh, Rosie was knighted by Serbia in 2018, and she was the co-author of The Diplomatic Mission of Captain Dr. A David Al Ala. Is that right? Yes. Um, Rosie makes her home in Nevada City. So, without any further ado, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chi Chen Nan from uh, Harvard Library, um, or call me Nan, just what I go by. Uh, it's probably not often you find that a presenter turns up at the wrong session, uh, <laughs> but that's what's happened in this case because, uh, although this is built as a special format session, as you'll see, this is not especially about special formats, unless Mark is a special format. Um, I hope the title is reasonably self explanatory. Uh, but perhaps it's worth going over some of the reasons why uh, I think this is a worthwhile topic to consider. 
Um, so, so why put URIs in Mark? Um, uh, we've seen uh, at this conference uh, that uh, there's been some good progress made with uh, linked data editing tools even within the last 12 months. Uh, but nevertheless, we can expect that Mark will have a long half-life and be with us a long time. Most of our infrastructure is built around Mark, and we need to continue to support that. Um, at the same time, uh, linked data is happening. Um, and we need to align with uh, practices that, that are starting to come into um, library practice. And uh, linking mark, um, which I think is the Richard Wall a top term that Richard Wall has coined, uh, is emerging as a, a, a transition strategy where you build hooks in mark uh, into linked data, uh, uh, data entities. Um, and what you get out of that is cleaner conversion to linked data. An increasingly cleaner conversion from linked data, as you were hearing yesterday from the Library of Congress. Uh, and some of the, take, the ability to take advantage of some of the practices that are uh, coming into the community, the ability to use alternative sources of data, the ability to adopt mixed mode things. Um, I and at least one other person in this room, Nancy, uh, were involved in a PCC group uh, on URIs and Mark. Uh, we and some of our collaborators uh, uh, proposed some changes uh, that have now uh, uh, come into effect or in the process of coming into effect. Uh, subfield 0 and subfield 1 for real world objects are uh, now defined more consistently throughout the MARC format, including the authority format. Uh, subfield 4 has been extended to uh, relationship URIs, which I think is a, a worthwhile uh, expansion. Uh, Alternative sources of names are now explicitly recognized in the MARC format. And uh, there's now also a dedicated field for work identifiers, which are important for reasons I'll, I'll come to in a moment. So uh, how do you go about adding URIs to MARC? Um, uh, you can start by doing this. You take your traditional control access points, and uh, you provide URIs for them. Uh, and that's something that, that we are already doing. You, in WorldCat, you're seeing examples of this. Um, but you can actually go further. Um, you can actually enrich the record considerably more than that. Uh, here you see examples of relationships explicitly given uh, in subfield 4. Uh, you see um, non-traditional sources. For example, you see an ISNI there. Uh, instead of an LC authority. Uh, I actually don't know Jeff Fogate, he actually owns a copy of this book, I read it, I just did an example. <laughs> um, you also see the fact that uh, this is a cookbook explicitly called out in the 655 field. Um, and you see a work ID. Um, and this is important because our traditional practices don't really scale up to uh, uh, universal provision of work entities. This is something we either do with the help of algorithms or not at all. So I, I want to be clear about one thing I'm not saying when I show you this example. I'm not saying that if we can do it in Mark, we should. Okay. Um, nevertheless, Mark can carry more data. Can, we can extend the use of life, life, useful life of Mark and uh, start introducing uh, new practices more easily if we take advantage of these additional provisions. We also have the opportunity to simplify some of the practices. Uh, the, Hardcore catalogers in this room will look with pleasure on uh, uh, that kind of. I, I'm actually not an AV catalogger, so I probably have some of that wrong. And I know some, if someone sees an error, I know they'll tell me. Um, but as we heard from LC yesterday, some of that data is duplicative. Um, and there was a discussion, and, and the other uh, kind of thing that might be obvious to non catalogs is uh, if you look really hard, you can see that that's telling you that you're cataloging a CD. Uh, but it's actually not that obvious. Um, you could do something different. Uh, this was a discussion we had in the PCC best practices group the other day. Uh, you can just say that something is wrong like this. Okay. And then you can create an entity in which all of those uh, characteristics are here. Uh, so it's not in the big record anymore. It's out in the entity description. So you could do something like that. Um, what's the catch? Well. Um, AAT doesn't actually have anything uh, 
for an audio compact disc. There are photo discs for not audio compact discs. I couldn't find anybody who did actually have audio compact disc defined. So that's possibly a fruitful area of work for somebody. Uh, nevertheless, that kind of approach is much more extensible than all those sort of hard-coded PCD values that we have, or even the things that RDA provides for. Um, we can make our cataloging a lot more expressive uh, by adopting uh, those external categories. Here's another example. Um, here's uh, the post office building from my hometown of Melbourne, Australia. Um, it has no entry as far as I could see in the LC Authority file. It has one in, in Wikidata. Uh, and actually, Wikidata has about twice as many post offices as the LC Authority. <laughs> <laughs> not not playing one out much or anything, but um, um, so why wouldn't we use Wikidata uh, to describe uh, entities of this kind? Um, it buys you audience, gets you a much larger community of practitioners. You know, the the administrative this, uh, pipe dream of out of crowdsourcing. I mean, it's actually happening. Right? And there's other queries you can do if you uh, create your data in Wikidata, you can find all the post offices that are cultural heritage sites as the Melbourne post offices. Uh, which is not something that can be easily done through uh, LC Authority. So while well, some of the drivers for, for doing this, I've mentioned uh, more efficient cataloging, actually better cataloging, right? It can be better cataloging if we adopt um, data practices. practices. You can take advantage of workflows that are emerging for enrichment of legacy data. I gave the example of work, at, uh, work IDs, Casolini is doing similar work. Um, and increasingly, I think you'll see that uh, as metadata creation moves into native big frame or linked data formats, that's going to seem more and more pointless to go through hero heroic steps uh, to convert that data into uh, legacy mark data like some of the these fields that we have. Um, so if we can move, uh, transition our mark passes along the way, that side of the process will work, work more smoothly as well. So what do we need? And this is like a, a really like generic slide that you always see at the end of the presentations like this. Uh, we, we need the tools. We're starting to see uh, features in mark edit, in OCLC record manager that support some of the uh, functionality that we want. Um, something like uh, questioning authority, which some of you may have seen demonstrated at this uh, conference, could be just as useful in a MARC environment as in uh, a big frame environment. Um, also, we probably need to wean some of our legacy systems off their existing assumptions, like the assumption of a single name authority file. Um, so we need some of our existing systems to work a little bit differently from the way they do. There's certainly a lot of best practices, discussions we need to have. And that can be tricky because there's a, a little bit of a square peg in a round hole kind of aspects of those discussions, right? Like uh, the notion of a source is traditionally very closely tied to the idea of a preferred access point. Um, some of that goes away and it makes the discussion complicated. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we need some experience doing this. We need to understand people's use cases and take them to them. Uh, I made a list of some related uh, resources you might there, and that's my email address if you want to get in touch. Thank you. Morning. Uh, I'm Peter uh, from Stanford. So I would like to tell you, you know, my experience of uh, putting a control vocabulary in Wikidata. So uh, 
my experience mostly from uh, you know, helping uh, process uh, foreign digital connections. And um, in Stanford, we have a large game collections. I'll show you some of this. This is one of our collection, Steve Cabinetti. Uh, in this collection, we have about 13,000 software items. 90% of them are games. Uh, and then when we attack that, you know, sometimes you see funny things. <laughs> we saw some you know, chewing gums, which is packaged with video game. And then we have to ask our conceptor to help us to see whether <laughs> what to do with the chewing gum. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, some design notes from uh, software uh, video game developer. So they donate their own in the whole you know, uh, design process of how they develop a video game uh, to us. And we have uh, Atari business plan from the 1970 something. <laughs> I think it's the 1973 uh, Atari uh, business plan. And we have a photo collection of taking the you know, people playing video game. And there's a paper catalog <laughs> on software titles <laughs> published in the 1980s. So uh, video game, uh, actually, we, we have quite a few video game control vocabulary in Wikidata. Most of them are related to platform. So uh, I think there's an advantage and disadvantage, because all those are platforms. <laughs> so I think if people are, you know, want to relate a video game to those uh, control vocabulary, it's difficult to them too, uh, because so many. Uh, but genre is different. There's no genre, uh, you know, video game genre control vocabulary in uh, Wikidata. And last year, OLAC actually published the uh, video game control vocabulary. There are 66 general terms. So uh, that's the instance in Open Metadata Registry. So they, they list uh, all of them in RDF format. And so those are the steps <laughs> we need to include the OCLC uh, video game general in Wikidata. First, we need to propose, uh, as you know, Wikidata, everyone can just go to create an item, but you can not just go to create a property. So property, you have to propose. So we have to propose to the Wikidata community. We want that uh, external identify as a property. And then, after you know, people approve that uh, proposal, then you go to create a property and then uh, create a mix and match to uh, help you to connect the existing uh, records to the identifier and confirm the entry is uh, correct. And then uh, if you know, there's no entries in Wikidata, then you have to create one yourself. And remember in uh, the control vocabulary, because we have the narrower border concept, so we can also embed that relationship in Wikidata. And the last one is, uh, I, with the help of colleagues around the world, I translate, we translate it into German, French, Chinese, Korean, Japanese. So that control vocabulary has six different languages. So this is our you know, proposal. We actually, you know, in initially I think that will take a long time, but at the end is less than two weeks. So we can approve. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that's the video uh, game camera. Uh, and then we create a mix and match. If you attend uh, Andrew's. Uh, sessions, you know, there are tools in Wikidata that help you to match the existing uh, pop or the existing items in Wikidata to whatever you suggest, whether try to help you to find a match against what you propose and the existing uh, items. So you create a mix and match and you see. So uh, the algorithm will try to match this with the existing one and then ask you to confirm or remove. So you 
can try to you know see but if it's a match then you go to confirm it's not then you have to go to remove it and then there are something that is not match then if no match then you have to go to create one and they, they list you you know all the manually match one and at the end you know you get a report of how many are manually matched, automatically matched, no Wikidata, uh, not able to Wikidata. So that's one <laughs> item, because when we upload, uh, create a mix and match, we include an item that is not uh, data. <laughs> so somehow it's a noise. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the general, uh, the control vocabulary actually has the border concept. So if you just do that match, you don't have that uh, properties uh, relationship in the uh, Wikidata control vocabulary. So, but luckily I find there's a property called order concept, P4900, and that's actually uh, you can use to express the border match concept. And this is the one, and with uh, some people, that's great if they, you know, they are uh, Sparkle query experts, you know, they help us to you know, do that uh, Sparkle query and then that lists all the terms, you know, I send the link to people and then they just enter whatever, you know, Chinese, Korean, uh, Japanese, uh, French, German. So, there are other related, well, in Wikidata, if you are new, the, the issue, one issue is there are 6,000 something properties. And then uh, you have to find you know, the, the right properties to express uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, there are narrower concepts, you know, subclass of exact match, so uh, you will be uh, careful, you need to be careful to you know, see what properties are you know, related to what you want to do. So there are some issues in uh, Wikidata, of course, properties you have to ask, <laughs> you have to propose, you cannot really you know, uh, uh, create your own properties. And multiple models you know, in, uh, can happen in Wikidata at the same time. So if you are going to look at one item, sometimes it's very confusing because you know, there are different models existing. Uh, and of course, I don't get hit by it anymore. Uh, and the last one is uh, data published as public domain. Sometimes we have limitation on that because our donor agreement with our donor. So some donor agreement cannot, don't allow us to put things as public domain. So that's sometimes is a constraint for us. And. Uh, there's a, actually there's a software, Wikibase is the software that power Wikidata. And you can also download Wikibase and then have an instance of Wikibase in your institution. So if you do that, actually it helps us to control because now it's your own instance of my Wikidata. So you can control who can edit and then uh, you can implement the data model that is you know, best suit for your use, and of course the uh, the public domain issue uh, will go away because you can assert your own uh, rules. And I think well, I list some Wikibase user, OCLC, UI song, German National Library, and then that's the people I, I work with. Uh, Tracy from German, Jin from. Uh, he didn't mention his originality, I cannot find. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a very, very active member <laughs> in Wikidata. Uh, so he's the core person, I, I should say, in a Wikidata video game. Uh, Jin Hai is from Washington University. Uh, she's helped to uh, translate into Korean. And uh, Fukuda is from Richmond University, helping us to do the translation in Japanese.
I'm Mark McGee. I'm Geosp geospatial metadata librarian. I trip over my own title. <laughs> uh, at the Harvard Library, um, I have a background in all types of geospatial metadata, um, paper maps, etc. I'm here today to talk to you about a linked data for libraries um, subproject that we're exploring at Harvard around um, describing uh, our, some of our scanned maps in our collection as linked data descriptions. Um, the map collection is home to over 400,000 sheet maps dating back to 1493. Many of these are rare and unique materials. Um, 5,000 of our maps have been scanned and are made discoverable through, freely through our catalog and through our image delivery uh, service. Um, and then the focus of this sub-project is really on describing uh, the digital versions of these maps. Uh, recently scanned uh, from our Evelyn collection, which is our foundational donation, which happened 200 years ago last year. Um, so following on that anniversary, we're, we're going to try to make some of these images free, freely available. Um, the goals of the project are pretty simple. Uh, we want to promote open discovery, access, and reuse of map material by building on existing library metadata to generate linked data descriptions of materials. We want to share the scanned images through Wikimedia Commons or, and or IIIF images. Um, and we want to develop ongoing workflows uh, for continued resource sharing. Um, uh, this will become apparent in a second. Um, our reality is we're still cataloging a large portion of our legacy materials. 400,000 maps is a lot of maps. And we're, we like to say we're about 50% cataloged. Um, <laughs> We don't really know. Um, we go to extraordinary lengths to catalog some of these materials and personal peril. Um, I don't have that table here. It's one of our catalogers um, taking some annotations to put into our catalog. Um, and Mark, for all its datedness, really does do provide some rich data points for modern uh, web applications, for building modern web applications. Um, you can see here uh, we have a customization to our catalog to show um, the bounding box of, of the map that's being described. That's generated from, from MARC um, data. Um, uh, and from these coordinates, we can also do fun things like spatial search. So MARC has been good to us. Um, however, in our current systems, it's uh, difficult to discover these maps um, outside of our catalog. And um, in our case, it's difficult also to reuse uh, to reuse the images because they're in our institutional repository and in order to get access to them for full use you have to request them at a cost. Um, map collection is really interested in um, making these more widely available so we've been exploring Wikimedia Commons as a, as a means of delivering these um, images. Um, uh, and so the goal of this our original idea for this project was basically to publish a selection of these images out to Wikimedia Commons with associated Wikidata metadata uh, so that they would be findable, reusable. Um, since initially proposing uh, work for this project, Harvard has implemented a IIIF access point for our, our images. Unfortunately, they're still not full resolution, so um, that day will come, I'm hopeful. Uh, so it's somewhat, li we're still somewhat limited I was relatively new to Wikidata, and um, as, as a newcomer to Wikidata, it can be sometimes uh, difficult to track down uh, it, it previously existing projects, standards, uh, being able to see what's current, uh, what's current practice, what's standard practice. Um, one thing that uh, does exist is this Wiki Project Maps, which outlines historical map properties, uh, which uh, has been tremendously huge. Useful. So we did we did an environmental scan. We found this, um, and um, you know we, we looked at some existing map descriptions in Wikidata. At uh, last query, uh, we're around thirteen thousand map description uh, descriptions of maps in Wikidata. So that's not really a large body of um, bibliographic descriptions to really learn from. Um, so we use this as a starting point. Um, there are 
we did find um, within the property set um, a large portion of the of the types of properties we would and concepts we would expect to describe um, in in a mark record. Um, so we get coordinate data, uh, projection information, scale. Um, oh, one thing that is uh, uh, was. Uh, a little confusing was the bounding box, and you can see that, uh, that there's a little uh, unsolved properties at, at the bottom there, um, which uh, some you know libraries have have been using for a while. Um, so we started by making some sample map descriptions, um, and in Wikidata, just a few, and then what 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 the goal of this is is really. I would like to be able to use the LD for P Synopia editor with Wikidata properties and uh, to be able to publish out uh, descriptions to the Wikimedia Commons. So set up a mapping, essentially, uh, looking at all the you know, BibPrint properties um, uh, aligned with Wikidata and any issues that I could foresee uh, coming across with, with those properties. Uh, we will be building on uh, the conversion from our mark records that um, the ShareVDE tool will be providing in the in the, Wiki, in the in the Synopia editor. So we'll be starting from you know cataloging that already exists, but describing the instance of the digital object um, using the Wikidata uh, property uh, Wikidata lookups with BibFrame properties. It may be overly complex, <laughs> um, but it's it's something that I wanted to kind of explore at the level to really understand um, and question our modes of cataloging. Um, so this is the Synopia editor, the linked data editor tool will be coming very soon where we'll be able to test our uh, the profile that we've created um, from that translation. Um, there's a lot of open questions at this point. Um, so Will you know how, how are we actually going to convert the Synopia BibFrame descriptions to Wikidata? Are we going to use quick statements? Are we going to use Sparkle? Um, something else um, that I can point the finger out. Um, you know, are are we going to use the Wiki Commons image, or are we going to do Harvard Triple IF images in our Wikidata descriptions? Are we going to provide both? Um, I would probably lean towards both, at least for this project. Um, scaling later. Um, Um, and I, I'm also interested, I learned so much at this meeting, um, the structured data on the commons, how that interacts with Wikidata, um, uh, you know, where pieces of the descriptions will go. <laughs> will they go to Wikimedia Commons? Will they go to Wikidata? Um, we want to evaluate, uh, you know, whether using Wikidata entities with BibFrame properties are, are actually useful in the short term. Um, we want to evaluate the types of descriptive opportunities that are opened by using Wikidata properties. I'm excited by the depicts property, um, something that isn't typically, um, it, it's a slight twist on what we're doing with subject headings with maps. Uh, we don't always say what's depicted on, on a map. If there's a, a, an image in the margin, you know, we, can, we can use that to our advantage of something that used to exist in notes. And I was also I was also struck by the description and inclusion talk yesterday, which got me to thinking about how we approach applying geographic subject headings. Um, the map that I showed earlier is 1877 in the Black Hills region. Um, so you know we did use the, the subject heading um, Black Hills for that, but you could easily see someone using North Dakota uh, as a as common practice. We we apply current current geographies to historic places see that as um, an issue with um, inclusivity. So I'm interested in exploring those types of questions. Um, and I, I also believe we have a lot to contribute back to the Wikidata community around, uh, we can help with uh, property pr proposals around relief, bounding box, uh, we can help with class structures around types of maps, projections, these sorts of things. I'm interested in contributing back. Um, and so in conclusion, uh, I consider this experimental. Um, 
project is not about mass generation of, or conversion of data. It's really uh, about learning what is possible by working directly with the materials, the editors, and the ontologies. Um, and kind of learning from that and scaling. So thanks. There's resources here. New experience. I've never worked on Google Slides before, so um, good morning. I'm Nancy Fallerin from the National Library of Medicine. Um, so I am not going to talk about Wikidata, uh, <laughs> which may be a relief to those who are tired of hearing about it. Um, and, I, and I hope this is not going to get too down in the weeds. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what um, um, NLM's LD4P2 cohort project. And um, uh, serials are the bread and butter of the National Library of Medicine. Um, we have an indexing section that um, indexes uh, biomedical journal articles. Um, we have the citations in, in um, PubMed and Medline. Um, so there are a lot of dependencies in other sections of the National Library of Medicine on the, the, the serials that we catalog. Um, so this is really this is a really important. Um, this is very important to us. And so one of the things that um, we know about serials in BibFrame, um, well, I should start again. My colleague, Tina Schrader, <laughs> um, has served on the um, PCC um, uh, Concert BibFrame task group, looking at how serials could be cataloged with BibFrame. Um, and she also served um, as co-chair of um, a Zafira working group on cataloging serials with BibFrame Lite. So she's got a lot of background in this, and she is our serials cataloging guru. Um, so if you have questions to us, so let me also say, I am not a serials cataloger. <laughs> I am a meditative librarian. She is teaching me as we go along. Um, so, um, and, and she's doing a great job. <laughs> so um, at any rate, so, um, so we know that, that BibFrame, as it stands right now, is not um, entirely friendly for serials catalogers. So um, when NLM proposed to join the cohort, um, we started out, our first, our initial proposal was that we wanted to do everything. Um, and so then we kind of sat down, so I was trying to draft that proposal and realized this is never going to work. Um, so, um, so we went back to the group and said, okay, we need to scope. What's, what's really important to us? And, and really what was important was serials. And we also needed to think, what could we do over the course of approximately a year and a half after we got, you know, once we figured out that we were accepted, we really had about a year and a half to June 2020. So what, what, could, we, what could we propose that we could actually accomplish in that period of time? So we scoped really carefully. Um, and, and our proposal actually has five tasks, and this is the second task, um, which focuses on, um, in what I'm going to talk about today, which, which focuses on um, what we can do to make BibFrame friendlier for serials cataloging. So um, what we want to do is to look at BibFrame, and, and BibFrame, and actually what we've, do, we've done is pulled the, um, uh, the BibFrame um, serials um, profile to see um, what we can use, what we can't use, what needs, what needs enhancement. So that's, that's part of our task. Um, and our goal is to create a community usable application profile for serials. Um, we're not looking to create something that only NLM can use. We want community input. This should be a community product. Um, as part of that, um, we expect that we'll need to suggest additions or changes to the BigFrame model. Um, and then if BibFrame can't accommodate us, um, we need to look at other ontologies and see if there's something else out there that we can use to, to fill the need. And if not, then the possibility of um, internally creating what we need and sharing that with the community. 
which we hope not to have to do. So what have we done today? So actually I will say I'm, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in, in a short period of time. Um, so Tina has taken the lead on reviewing the, um, the concert bid frame findings again, so that we can go back and see what, let's not start from scratch, so let's build on what's already been done. Um, so we went back and we took a look at those, um, those findings, and some of them we threw out and said, mm, actually, no, this is not really something that needs to be done, and, and others we kept, and others we saw that the Library of Congress had already started to accommodate. So, so that was helpful. Um, and then we compared the, the bid frame, the concert findings, to the serials profile, as I said, to kind of see what's been done. Um, and then, um, then we started looking at, well, at the same time, we started looking, really going, doing a deep dive into bid frame and also into other ontologies to see um, what we could use and um, what was usable, what's not usable, what was practical, what wasn't practical. Um, since then, um, we've also cloned, in anticipation of editing the serials profile, we've cloned the profile, um, and that's, and we put that on, on GitHub, and that's waiting for work. Um, and then we've um, also been in contact with the Library of Congress about some questions that we've had and have found them to be very accommodating. <laughs> so those people who know me know that I, I am very verbose, <laughs> so doing this talk within seven minutes is a huge challenge for me. <laughs> Um, so, very quickly. Um, so this is what we've done, this is, this is the, the biggest problem that I think um, for cataloging serials in bid frame is um, how do we express minor changes over time. And so, um, and so I don't think he's here, but I owe a shout out to Stephen Folsom. Um, I had come up with an idea to use um, Pravo, and I figured if anybody knew about Pravo, it would be Stephen. So I sent him an email and said, is this kosher, would this, would this work? And Stephen wrote back and said, well, it's not, but why don't you just do this? And the this was, use this extended bid frame um, property um, applies to. So I thought, wow, this is a great idea. So I contacted um, Jody Williamson at the Library of Congress and said, is this kosher? Can I do this? And she said, wow, that's a great idea. Yeah, do that. So, so what, we are what we're planning to do is for, for um, minor title changes, changes in frequency, change in the publisher, um, and changes in enumeration and chronology, we can just create another, um, an additional variant title, and we can use VM applies to, to say this is the coverage. This, it applies to um, these, these dates or these issues. And, you can, and, and, um, and that way we can make those changes without having to create a new work or create a new instance. Um, the problem there, it's still, it's, we're still working this out, because the problem there is that there is no way for us to, to give a start and end of the coverage, um, unless we, because, because as you know, serials are live. So if we give a start, um, how do we, we have to, to deprecate that triple in order to add an end to it and create a new triple that gives, it gives both the beginning and the end. When, so for instance, if a frequency changes and then it changes again, we need to give the start of that frequency and the end of that first frequency and then the beginning of the next frequency. And then if that frequency ends, then we have to give another way to do that. So anyway, right now, so what we'd really like to do is have two separate properties for that. And BitFrame has properties, first issue and last issue, but they are not um, usable. Um, the constraints don't allow us to use them um, with, with applies to. So we have a request in at LC right now to lift those constraints and to change the definitions, to broaden the definitions of those properties so that we can use them and we feel that will solve the problem. So we're really hoping that LC will go along with that. Um, the other issue that we have um, is indexing because we want to also be able to offer coverage for indexing. Something is indexed in something and what um, volumes and issues are indexed in, in that, uh, by that, that entity. Um, and again, we also want to be able to use first and last issue for that. And again, um, this is what we have found in, in um, BidFrame was that LC has extended properties that will help us. So indexed in and applies to, again, we can use. Um, NLM's title abbreviations are at the work level. And um, up until recently, um, title abbreviations were only allowed at the instant level. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, and, 
so, so I was just talking to Jody Williamson last week, and she was explaining to me that that had been uh, extended so that you can now put title abbreviations at the work level. So um, very, very quickly, very, very quickly, um, I just want to say, so we still have a little bit of work to do. Um, the most important thing that I want to mention is that we are planning to put out a call for an affinity group to work on serials. Um, we hope that people will join. Our goal with this, and, and we'll do that within the next week or two, we expect. Um, we wanted to get some experience before we put out that call and have a better feel for what was needed. Um, and what we're hoping for is additional input. What are some of the things that we have not thought about that need to be done for serials cataloging? Um, we, wanna, we want collaboration on the profile that we're creating, and then we want people to bang on it. Um, we really want it to be a community profile that people are going to use, they're going to bang on it, and then come back and say, this doesn't work, this works. Um, so that we can then present it collaboratively to the community, to PCC, to the Library of Congress, and say, let's, you know, we, have, we have consensus on this, let's use it. So we don't want to work on this alone. If you have questions, you can talk to me. If you have serious questions, please contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
new works are emerging because of the fact that people are mining the archives for new and for, you know for, for new ways of capturing things. I have things on my table that have yet to be cataloged by me that really have a 19, you know, 2018, 2019 copyright date. So it's continuing to grow. So the question is, how does this information in the bibliographies get released out in a way where we can begin to exploit it in a much more dynamic fashion and evolve it over time? Um, this is a diagram showing the workflow that I put together out of the tooling that I was using personally here. You know, first started with a PDF file, <coughs> uh, writing a simple script to convert that PDF to text using the standard libraries that are available there. Breaking that down into a file per category because of the stylistic differences and how the text is laid out to make it easy then in the second step to be able to build just very simple regular expression driven pattern matching to extract information about uh, a particular instance out of the bibliography. And then once an initial pass of that is taken, work both in text editors and in Python notebooks to kind of massage that information, validate it, review it, and get it into shape to be a clear bid frame representation of the given instances that are there in the document. And I apologize to those in the back. The font on this is small, but I wanted to just kind of show the steps of uh, you know, taking a particular entry, this is uh, uh, Shotlander 852, the work is Sinki Sana, this is the A uh, uh, variant, the instance there. Um, taking, you know, the, the first step is really just to kind of put it into a very, very simple bid frame. We're dealing with titles, we're dealing with uh, uh, provision activities, you know, publication events, notes, and so forth. So take the text, turn it into notes, take the basic asset metadata and turn it into what you would expect. But we can go further than that, and this is kind of the step where, you know, working with some of the tooling in Python for natural language processing and so forth, we can begin to work, you know, mining the notes, uh, for example, a note uh, illustrated by James Kern, turning that into a specific link to James Kern as um, an agent, a contributor in the role of illustrator, uh, doing a similar thing using the ARM ontology to be able to take information about the staple bound heart, no part about this issue, and turn that into descriptive note about the binding. Similarly, taking uh, information that's described lexically in terms of you know, various agents and places, and then going and doing the kinds of lookup and name authorities to be able to come up with you know, links, in this case, to, uh, to Wikidata. So this process is kind of uh, semi-automated, getting initially out into some kind of shape, serialized as turtle, and then working with that in the combination of editing textually directly and also bringing it into a Python notebook, creating an RDF graph in memory and then querying that and massaging that and then serializing that back out as turtle. So that's the kind of process that, uh, that we've worked through and developed this. Um, once those reviewed works and instances are there, they can be published and um, the the challenge I put to myself here is, look, I'm an individual. I have a day job. I've got a lot of stuff to do. I don't have the opportunity and, you know, and, and the bandwidth or even the money to be able to run infrastructure. What's the cheapest, simplest possible way for me to deliver this in a manner that would be usable by people in the link data community? I really took two paths. One, take you know, a very minimalist approach to publishing this data as a data set and create some scaffolding using Amazon's Lambda serverless um, uh, deployment mechanism to be able to just have a system that sat out there and responded to requests both to the entire data set dump and to the specific URLs assigned to the instances and the works that uh, were generated in the process. The second is to take the information in the linked data and then render that out as markdown and then publish that to GitHub pages. There's a lot of work in this conference, you know, on top of systems like Sanopia and so forth, and you guys have spent a lot of time and effort building the machinery to kind of do this in potentially a much more elegant way. The issue here is that as an individual working with this content and information and data, um, it looks like you know I can run a credible, scalable link data resource for you know tens of dollars a year using this kind of an approach. So to finish off, this is the kind of thing 
that I think with this sort of tooling is possible for a community, you know, in you know this ecosystem of booksellers, collectors, folks who are kind of adjacent to the traditional library world that, that, that is represented here. Uh, you know, people working with GitHub-based or Git-based repositories for collaborative review, you know, editing and publishing the manner I just described, that annotated bibliography can be, and can be combined with catalogs that really basically are linked data that just simply point to the relevant instance information in the annotated bibliography. Together with open knowledge resources like the name authorities, researchers can work in Python notebooks to be able to do the kinds of queries to massage that information to do what I think the number of talks uh, this conference have, have discussed with regard to how you can power digital humanities by doing more and more advanced queries over this data, this massive stuff that we can integrate now using these standards. And then finally, those changes that are suggested to the annotated bibliography can be simply in this kind of approach uh, pushed as uh, pull requests from the community such that the collaborators working on the annotated bibliography can review them and approve them and pull them in and have that be kind of the virtuous circle to get an annotated bibliography that's not exactly real time but much, much closer to, you know, uh, updated on a continuous basis than the sort of once every two, three, four years thing we see with kind of traditional print uh, based bibliography. So that's it. Uh, I have some links here uh, to um, GitHub repository of this work and uh, some of the live uh, systems that are, you know, some of the live content that you can get at on, on uh, the stuff that I have up there on Amazon. And, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Rosie Stevenson, good night, and I'm going to talk today about Women Writers in Review at Northeastern University. Women Writers in Review and the Cultures of Reception was established in 2010 as an initiative of the Women Writers Project. It supports research into the transatlantic reception and readership of early texts by women. Women Writers Project transcribed close to 700 brief documents, things like literary reviews, publication announcements, textual excerpts, and subscription notices published in Great Britain, Ireland, and the United States between 1770 and 1830. Women Writers Online is all about the 390 English language texts that are written, translated, or attributed to women published between 1526 and 1850. It is TEI encoded and published through Women Writers Online Interface. Whereas Women Writers in Review includes 690 English language texts responding to works written or translated by women, including literary and theatrical reviews, publication notices, and textual extracts. These were published between 1770 and 1830. They are TEI encoded and published through the Women Writers in Review interface. The first report generated from this work was published in 2016. Women Writers in Review has a limited tag set. The interface foregrounds discovery and exploration Encoded texts tend to be brief, representing a constrained set of genres and publication dates. Women Writers in Review and the Cultures of Reception <coughs> Project began at Brown University in 2010. The goal is to support collaborative research into the transatlantic reception and readership of texts by women. The first phase of this included selection, sourcing, and gathering of data on the text to be transcribed, 
setting up a transcription interface and a substantial amount of the encoding work. In 2013, the Women Writers Project moved to Northeastern University. Since then, the priorities of the project, including cultures of reception, has been to continue with the transcription, data cleanup, and creating a publication interface. So what's Cultures of Reception? Cultures of Reception is an initiative to transcribe and publish these texts responding to early modern works by women. While the corpus itself is small enough that it cannot be considered definitive, and while the complexity of the reception data is specific to the project, the hope is to demonstrate that focusing on metadata adds a great deal of value to the web publication mm -hmm. of the corpus. Documents include theatrical reviews, literary reviews, extracts, essays, biographies. As part of the transcription process, encoders note the original source of the document, identify the works by women mentioned or reviewed, identify the women creators mentioned or reviewed, tag the document with relevant themes, formats, and genres, and classify the reception of the main work on a positive to negative scale. What are the challenges? Well, a need for context to make each review useful. For example, not just the publication details of the review itself, but also those about the authors and the text being discussed. The second challenge is the relative obscurity of transcribed materials both in the likelihood that readers would look for the individual reviews and in the authorship and the titles. The goals, many. Linking between authors and texts in the interfaces between the theme category and the reception category. Making these materials easy to browse and to search. Supporting discovery and exploration. Offering a clean and readable display helping researchers ask questions like, how has Hannah Cowley been reviewed in British and American periodicals? What changes are evident in the British critic over time? How did periodicals in this period discuss questions of women's authorship? As we know, many of them use pseudonyms. Although reception history rubrics exist, Wikidata lacks a model for cultures of reception. This is what we're trying to do. We are trying to show the relationship in triplets between author and the written work, the written work and the literary criticism about the work, and then the present day review score of the literary criticism. Where do we go from here? Well, we have a lot of questions, starting with, how easily will the Women Writers in Review API transform into Wikidata? And is anyone else doing this sort of work, perhaps in another language or another era? Northeastern University's Ashley Clark and Sarah Connell are deeply involved in Women Writers in Review, while Amanda Russ, who spoke yesterday morning, and I are its evangelists. And we are keen on working with those who share a similar interest in transforming this project into Wikidata. I have a long list of appendices, and you'll have access to these because I'm going to upload it into Wikicommons. Thank you very much. Those who presented want to like turn themselves slightly to everybody else. And anybody has questions, um, be happy to answer them. Any questions? Yeah, Betty. Well, uh, these were all really fascinating, great session. Um, but to go back to the first now, um, <laughs> I think that's you know a really um, critical topic for us about because there will be this transition period. Um, that we'll all have to face. And I think you know, they 
said it yesterday that LC said it's not sustainable to, to do both for this long period. So I'm just wondering where Harvard is going in this. You have a number of options, but have you made any decisions? Are you uh, looking to put into practice any of your solutions? Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I guess I wouldn't say Harvard's moving us and other people, we have uh, an ISD pilot program that's being run by um, a better data management unit, particularly Michelle DeRosha who gets that unit. Um, and that's exploring these sort of alternative name sources uh, for, uh, for cataloging. And we'd like, uh, actually I'll give a plug to a, a pilot that uh, her group is promoting right now to have public institutions participate in creation and maintenance of these needs and using them in cataloging. That, that would be uh, uh, one area where uh, we're, we're exploring uh, the possibilities right now. Um, a lot of the other work, um, I'd say it's kind of what we're trying to do more at a community level. Well, we're part of the ACT, but um, uh, we're active in PCC because, well, I think Nancy made this point. It's something that's better done if it's done community wide rather than at the institution level. Um, There are some obstacles we might need to pursue um, with our uh, relevant partners. For example, I mentioned um, authority functionality in our IOS. It's still based on the assumption that you control the system a single vocabulary. That's a conversation we might take up with our vendor because that's a relevant uh, relationship to pursue the data. Um, but um, yeah, there's some things we do individually, but a lot of things it's better. to propose something that uh, I'm a project manager for a project called EPAD which process email and then the email ontology actually is not uh, I would like to propose some other properties and then uh, there's no active <laughs> uh, people you know on that particular uh, format so I was asked to just put it in a general discussion and see what uh, people say there are definitely people that are active um, and there's kind of from what I can tell there's a couple of different types of communities so there's the actual creating data like maps as data um, and then maybe lesser so dealing with the description of historic uh, 
um, maps. Um, one thing, Hillary Thorson, Hillary. Hillary's the Wikimedian in residence for, for the Leap for Peace project. One of the things that we've been discussing is bringing um, a property proposal, something that is, might be relatively uncontroversial at first. Um, cartographic relief, they don't have any properties for cartographic relief. Um, we've already modeled that in Mark, and I, as a subproject of the previous LD for P, have done some modeling to make it a little more um, hierarchical. Um, we were talking about bringing that to the community as a proposal as a way of kind of introducing ourselves and learning about the process um, uh, in that way. And I know there's been work at the British Library There's a question in the back. Uh, yeah, this is for uh, Nancy. You have this question about the uh, problem of modeling change over time. Mm -hmm. And I should sort of contextualize my ignorance in this question. Long, long ago, I was getting deep into RDF and semantic web, because back then it was called semantic web. Um, and clearly now I'm trying to get back into the game. And so back then, that sort of problem might have been tried to address with reified triples. Is your approach similar to reified triples? Are reified triples even still a thing? So, so um, I, so, so I will express my ignorance. <laughs> um, so I know the term reified triple, and for the life of me right now, I can't picture what a reified triple is. <laughs> so, so I will apologize for that. Um, so, so I think the sort of let me let me try to respond maybe a little differently. So um, the um, the issue that we have is that we we need to we need to be able to say something begins and something ends. And, and then that something begins again. Um, it, it all describing the same object, the same entity. And so um, the, the problem with the BibFrame ontology is that we don't have a way to do that. And um, the only way that we can do that now is perhaps by putting it in as a, a note. Um, and, then, and then, so you can put it in, because you know when it begins, you, you create the note when it begins. But then when it ends, what do you do, right? So you have to then deprecate that triple and create a new triple that says it started in an, another note. It says a replacement that says it begins and ends. And then you, and then you move on. And, so, and, and it's not a, an efficient way to handle the problem. So um, I'm just going to say something that's going to be much more intelligent than what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but, um, but and, and so and so what we're trying we're really trying hard to work with any bid frame if we can. And and so that's why we're we're asking them to because we feel that if they if they change the constraints and they change the definition on this first issue, last issue, those are two separate properties, be it first issue, be it last issue, then we can have those two separate triples. We don't have to deprecate anything. And it just makes it more efficient. So now Andrew can give you one more example. No, I, I was, I, I, I have a very simplistic view of reification, but which was just sort of, I think you're trying to apply it to serial, because it, and, and, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll defer to Gene even on what our experience was in use cases of passage. If we apply library systems thinking to something like creating a triple, that, that aspect of when and by whom the, the triple was made, mm -hmm. which is my simplistic view of reification, is going to come up, right? I mean, even, even for non-serials cataloging, you know, librarians tend to want to know when and by whom was the statement made. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I, I, but I see it being a bigger problem with serials because of the continuation problems or the changes problems. But I, I suspect that linked data work would just say, just make a new triple. Yeah. Um, and somehow relate them to each other rather than trying to qualify a triple with these other reified statements. Yeah, that, that's kind of the, that's, that is what linked data 
practices say for serials cataloging that's problematic um, because our our descriptions of serials are collaborative across institutions, so it's important for us. Like, and we're working with like fractured runs of serials, so we may have in my institutions volumes seven and eight of a serial, and we describe what we have, and then someone else comes along and they have the full run, volume one through 20. So they have more information and they know when all the changes have happened and they need to be able to add to our description of the serial to say what they know <laughs> in addition to what we know. That, that sounds like providence. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then that's, and that's problematic. And, but I think that actually, Sherry B, I think, um, Kelly, you're doing that. Um, when you are creating triples in ShareVD, you're putting in, in provenance Absolutely. information yes, 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 yes. so that you know where every statement has come from. Okay. Absolutely. That's crucial for a number of uh, uh, steps that can be necessary for maintaining uh, the data and so forth. And, uh, and to use the probo. Uh, yeah, and it, and it gives, it's important because it's one of the things that we talk about is, is the provenance really it can be really important because we know that there are people so I met someone yesterday who came up to me and said thank you for working at the National Library of Medicine because you yes. <laughs> because you do such amazing cataloging and we trust everything you do well that's fantastic and so knowing that that um, we've created a statement knowing that the statement comes from an LM it carries some authority with it whereas if it comes from Trump University do you really want to use it <laughs> you know? so so there so so that There's a question in the back. Um, you? Well, I, I was, I was going to show my ignorance by mentioning um, you know, structures that have basically to create an event, to create a URI for an event, and then have the time span of the event and what happens. And whether that would be useful at all, and I, I have been thinking better about it, I think not. But then, you know, it's sort of a time of reification. Changes in data, so that's another thing to throw aside. Okay. So I have a question for Mark. Um, so I, I know you guys did a hearing show on all human first um, all human and so I'm wondering how that's going to get surfaced. Will it get surfaced as an independent profile, or will it be endogenous to the brain, or yeah. Um, are you talking about the geospatial yeah. and yeah. cartographic? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we did develop some ALF files around some modeling we've done uh, adjacent to bit frame <laughs> that <laughs> apply to um, the geospatial and cartographic uh, realm. Um, I have had a hard time rallying community adoption. Um, uh, I have to, I I feel like we have the right players in the room, but there isn't a real home for it. So it's either to present it back to LC is maybe you should introduce this into BitFrame itself, which I think is probably the direct path. Um, but also we've, we've learned a lot in the process of modeling some of those areas and being able to apply it now to say Wikidata um, would be interesting too. So the structures describing the same thing. The structures are very similar. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably on me to turn it back to LC and say, to this. Uh, if anyone wants to help with that. <laughs> <laughs> so is it possible that your thinking has changed? Um, to be honest, I, I, when I called up, like I called it up when I was preparing for this, I looked at it and I was like, <laughs> was it was like an interpretation of good frame that is not it's not moving forward so yeah. I think it, yeah there's there's stuff that needs to be readdressed but I think I think the, the structure of it is somewhat sound yep. 
Right, I just want to throw a question out there. That a lot of this discussion is around what's the best approach in the long run for modeling. Where's the path of these resistance, right? And the topic of the cereals is around, I mean, do you use a, a, a technique like reification to try to patch around that, or do you simply extend the ontology to something that's a little bit more humanly interpretable? Understand that there are open questions here. What's the consensus? Just simply ontology refinement and extension will win the day in the long run, or whether you, whether we're going to have to go to modeling techniques or methods of representation that kind of break the sort of linked data slash RDF kind of tooling. I don't know if I said that clearly enough, but I mean, then, I mean, is there, is there hope that it can be dealt with within the long run? <laughs> I can say from, from the last LD3P grant that, that there was, there, Bill specifically said no ontology <laughs> development going forward. That wasn't, that wasn't like the, like the, the, the grant wasn't going to support that specifically. Okay. But, um, but that, yeah, that doesn't get to the philosophy that you're asking. Um, it's, it's hard. Um, it, it is, yeah. And that, so, so I guess what I would say is, so BitFrame is still a work in progress. So it is still open to change um, and, and to modeling changes and to, and to extension. And so to the best that we can, to the extent that we can, um, and it's not um, particularly welcoming to extensions from other ontologies. So, so I think um, to the extent that we can, this is this, if this is what the library community has decided to use, we will try, try to extend it um, and improve upon it. Um, and and then I, I and then I think hopefully it'll be an iterative process in where we, we see this isn't the kind of way we need to go and we change. Um, so, but I don't think there is any consensus. I, I don't think that there's no there's no best practice. There's no there's no. Um, I think we're, we're still, even after this time, I think in some cases we're still leveling through. And as a community, we are still learning. So there's consensus that there's no consensus. <laughs> I don't think that's what, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, because that's not a really great answer, but I, but I really do think that's the answer, is that, is that we're still, so the, I don't know if anybody heard the woman who spoke yesterday, I think she was from Nacogdoches, uh, from the small library in Texas. And she was saying how she feels she's so far behind and we all know so much more than she does and whatever. And, and actually, she's not behind. She's just started a little bit later. She's where I started in 2012. She's exactly where I was when I started. And, and the only difference is that I'm muddling a little further ahead than she is. And there's no clear path. There's no, you know, there's no path to say, this is what, this is what you do to learn. You know, it's like you did. It's, you try it. Um, you, you read, you do whatever, you talk to college, you network. Stephen Folsom has been incredibly helpful to me. Um, and, and then you kind of, you work your way through. So we're still, I think as a community, we're still learning and we're, we're still muddling through. I think OCLC could probably agree. They're still trying to figure out what's the path and what are the, what are the tools that they can produce to help us. And we're all, we're all kind of in it together and trying to work together and figure it out and, and iteratively. So as I said, if we find out that this is not Best way to go, then, then iteratively, as hopefully as a community, um, you know, will we'll change. Clearly, if anybody, oh, sorry, go ahead. clearly, if anybody had figured this all out, we would need to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
that very uh, open-ended ending, um, I think the session is over. And now there's um, a break before the second session. So thank you all, and thank you to our presenters as well. Yeah. <laughs>